Good evening and welcome everyone to um, the National First Ladies Libraries um, Cooking with the First Ladies. Tonight we have Sarah Morgan um, who will be featuring uh, by, um, recipes by uh, Florence Harding. So I'm very excited to um, welcome you all to uh, to this tonight's program. The National First Ladies Library is located in at uh, the First Ladies National Historic Site in Canton, Ohio, where I'm talking to you now. I'm Michelle Gullion. I'm the Director of Collections and Research here. And I'd like to welcome everyone uh, and also have uh, introduce uh, our new President CEO, Patty Dowd-Smith. Welcome, Patty. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Michelle. Welcome everyone. As Michelle said, this is a great program tonight, uh, Cooking with the First Ladies with Florence Harding. Sarah Morgan has been with us for a long time here doing a lot of wonderful Cooking with the First Lady programs. We're very excited to have her and she's got some great recipes for you tonight. So I wanted to see if everyone um, would be willing to put where you're from in the chat. We love to find out where everybody's coming here from and uh, we know we have people from all over the country and sometimes even all over the world. So we really appreciate you supporting our First Ladies programs and especially this great program here, Cooking with the First Ladies. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Michelle and Sarah and we'll get ready to go. Have a great time. Thank you, Patty. Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Patty, so much. We're so grateful to have Patty here. And um, like I said, please um, put in the chat where you're from. Um, we're looking forward to um, hearing where you're from and seeing where you're from and, and sharing that. Um, to uh, Before I get started, I have a couple of things I want to, um, to uh, do with housekeeping, that type of thing. Um, First of all, I think you maybe saw some of these things um, scrolling as we got started. On August 1st, um, uh, we'll have a legacy lecture with uh, Carl Anthony. He'll be speaking uh, regarding his book called Camera Girl, The Coming of Age of Jack Jackie Bouvier Kennedy. Um, he'll be, it'll be a question and answer with him and I. And um, if, if you are not, um, if you're not able to to uh, attend it, uh, that that legacy lecture, we'll be doing a a, a, a re repeat of this of our program. We'll be carrying on our conversation about Jackie Kennedy before she was Jackie Kennedy on uh, virtual uh, by uh, on September 14th. He'll be here at the site doing a book signing that night. So if you're in the in the area, please stop by and say hi to Carl and get your book signed. Um, the second thing I wanted to point out was um, on August 28th, I hope those of you who can will join us for book club where um, the book we'll be reading is Mrs. Kennedy and Me by Clint Hill. Clint Hill was um, Jackie Kennedy's uh, Secret Service agent and um, very wonderful book that we'll be reading. Um, I'm, I've read it before. I'm, I'm literally enjoying reading it again. And I look forward to sharing it with others. Uh, that will be Monday night, August 28th at six o'clock. On September 18th, we're going to be having a later than normal uh, legacy lecture in, in the week, but um, we're going to be having a portrayal, a historical portrayal of Jackie Kennedy by Leslie Goddard. And I've heard wonderful things about, uh, about her portrait portrayals, and that will be Monday, September 18th at noon. So what, join in if you can. And then finally, we'll be back on track with our legacy lectures normally, which happen on the at the beginning of the month. Um, on October 4th, uh, we'll be having um, uh, Oline Eaton speaking about uh, her book, Finding Jackie, A Life Reinvented. She talks about just the polar opposite of what Carl Anthony is talking about, where she talks about what happens to Jackie Kennedy after uh, she is widowed and uh, her it includes her marriage to Aristotle Onassis. So don't miss that. It sounds like it should be really, really interesting. One, what, a few last things here before I turn it over to, um, to Sarah. Uh, we encourage you to use the, the chat. Let us know where you are, of course. Um, and we also, if you're having any problems, technical issues, please um, 
write those in the chat. Uh, Kate Hines is our new, and we're so grateful to have her. She's behind the scenes, and she is a whiz. She'll be able to help you out. Uh, we're also uh, uh, taping this on Facebook, and you can catch it on Facebook if you can't get on by Eventbrite or Zoom. Um, and also, then uh, this will be taped, and it's gonna it'll be on our YouTube channel in about forty eight hours. 28 out 24 hours. So um, if you're not able to to check it out uh, in 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 real per time, then you'll be able to see it then. Um, any questions you have for Sarah should be put in the question. Q&A um, button, and you should submit them to her um, in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And um, we will answer those questions then at the end of the program. And without further ado, it's such a pleasure, as always, to uh, introduce you and turn it over to Sarah Morgan, the fabulous uh, First Lady Cook. And uh, she's going to be talking to us about um, Florence Harding. I can't wait. Thank you, Sarah. Yay, awesome. <clears throat> well, again, hey, y'all, I'm Sarah, and welcome to, of course, Cooking with the First Ladies Live uh, for the National First Ladies Library. Um, so like Michelle said, um, this evening, I will be discussing Florence Harding, um, who was just this strong-willed, progressive, and very vocal feminist who, among many things, operated a movie camera, flew airplanes, and literally was all that jazz. Uh, now, this evening, we're going to be making Florence's famous waffle recipe, almond cookies, which have a very surprising story, um, which I'll tell you about later, um, and a recipe I originally cooked for her, um, an eggplant salad that's West Coast style. So, of course, I primarily got all of my research from the National First Ladies Library resources, but also the Warren G. Harding Presidential Library and the PBS American Experience documentary on the Roaring Twenties. Uh, but first, as always, let's start this evening with a cocktail. Um, this evening, we're going to be making a gin ricky, uh, which is also actually Washington, D.C.'s official cocktail. In fact, July is gin ricky month in D.C. And while the uh, recipe for a gin ricky originally called for bourbon or whiskey, it was replaced during Prohibition with bathtub gin. Uh, so the cocktail was also featured and served to Daisy in the classic 1925 novel, The Great Gatsby. Um, now, as First Lady during the Prohibition era, Florence publicly supported following the laws of the 18th Amendment, but also refused uh, to support the women's temperance movement. Uh, she herself was not really a drinker and was hardly ever seen with a cocktail, but ironically served as the bartender during her husband's weekly card games, as well as their private parties. Um, in fact, the alcohol the Harding served was most likely alcohol that had been con confiscated by the Justice Department. Um, so to make our gin ricky, um, normally you just go ahead and mix this and put it all just straight into a highball glass, but we're going to do it a little different this evening. So we're going to take two ounces of gin and put that on some ice. And then we're gonna take four ounces of lemon juice, excuse me, lime juice. And then we're gonna take four ounces of club soda. Okay. And then what we're doing a little bit different is we are going to be serving this in a teacup because um, that's, how the flappers would uh, drink uh, their cocktails in the 20s. They drank them out of teacups. Um, now this particular teacup is Vaseline glass or uranium glass, which actually contains trace amounts of the element uh, uranium. Um, and it gives it this uh, green, greenish yellow color and it actually glows under a black light. And I think it's gonna be pretty difficult to see. And actually I don't think my black light's going to work, but. Um, if you ever come across Vaseline glass um, at the antique store, you can use a black light and you can test it, but normally this would glow. Um, so this was a very popular uh, type of glass from the 1880s all the way through the 1920s. Uh, but during World War II, production completely ceased because of the United States confiscation of, rainy, of uh, uranium for the Manhattan Project. Now, radium is massively more radioactive than uranium, uh, but it's a byproduct nonetheless. 
Um, now, one of my favorite stories from the 1920s is the story of the Radium Girls. Uh, the Radium Girls were so excited to work in these factories, especially in the 1920s. They were paid very well. Um, and what they were doing is they were uh, painting using Undark, uh, which uh, was a paint that was created um, using radium. Um, so they were painting watch face dials and airplane instruments um, for the soldiers in World War I. So what they were doing, they would dip their uh, little paintbrush into their paint, radium laced paint, and then they would lip point it. So they were essentially licking radium every single day. Um, the reason they thought that they were lucky is because radium was a very expensive product. Um, for a time, there was a radium craze and they were putting it in literally everything. Um, cosmetics, lotions, water, all sorts of things. Um, so unfortunately, the radium girls that were exposed to all of this, um, they started dying very painful deaths. Um, ultimately, some of them did sue the radium corporations, um, but a lot of them passed away before they could see anything come of that. Um, but their legacy lives on today. It's why we have like workplace standards and things like that um, for safety practices. Uh, but also because of radium and its half-life that is so long, they're actually still glowing in their graves today. Um, they would go out about the town. They were known as the shining girls because they literally glue, glowed because of the paint that was uh, left over um, on their clothing. So um, cheers to the 1920s. And um, I'm gonna step over here and uh, do a short little PowerPoint presentation about Florence and then we'll get cooking. So the 1920s were known most famously, of course, as the Roaring Twenties and the decade that was a goodbye to the Victorian, Victorian era and its old school ways, leading to a time when women could vote, airplanes soared through the sky, and debauchery was rampant. And most importantly, saw one of the most progressive women, Florence Harding, take on the role of first lady. Jazz blossomed, uh, Art Deco peaked, and the Charleston made its dancing debut. The era of wonderful nonsense had many interesting fads, including dance marathons, kissing contests, and goldfish swallowing. Now, before planking, there was pole sitting, which involved sitting on top of a pole for as long as possible, with Alvin Shipwreck Kelly being one of the most famous. The jazz age, of course, saw the birth of jazz and was developed in New Orleans by African-American communities. The radio allowed for this genre of music to spread widely in America and eventually made its way abroad. A few of the most popular jazz musicians were Louis Armstrong, Jelly Roll Morton, and Duke Ellington. The era saw a boom in automobiles, telephones, motion pictures, and household electricity, in addition to the significant changes in lifestyle and culture. The radio made its major debut, and the Harding White House saw the installation of the first wireless, as it was called, which also led to the first presidential address via radio. The media began to focus on celebrities, especially sports heroes and movie stars. A few famous stars of the silent screen and later during the introduction of the talkies were Mary Pickford, Charlie Chaplin, and Greta Garbo. Large baseball stadiums were built in major US cities in addition to palatial cinemas appropriately called dream palaces. Mahjong became a popular game, crossword puzzles were introduced and Reader's Digest began publishing in 1921. Additional inventions included band-aids, frozen foods with bird's eye brand being the first, water skis, electric blenders, and the modern version of sunglasses. For women, knee-length skirts and dresses became acceptable, bobbed hair with a Marcel wave was the bee's knees, and they were smoking and drinking out of those porcelain teacups and the speakeasies. These ladies who pioneered these trends were of course known as flappers, and Zelda Fitzgerald is often known as the first. Her husband, F. Scott, described the 1920s in his book, The Great Gatsby Writing. The parties were bigger, the pace was faster, the shows were broader, the buildings were higher, the morals were looser, and the liquor was cheaper. Now, Coco Chanel is credited with being the fashion icon of the 20s, influencing the shorter hairstyles, and her little black dress was described by Vogue as Chanel's Ford, as it was 
popular and widely available, just like Henry Ford's cars. Now, Florence was uninterested for the most part in fashions, but was also a 1920s version of an influencer, as many first ladies are, and was supposedly always concerned over her appearance. Now, besides fashion choices, which also included raccoon coats, women in the 20s were making much more important strides where only men had in the previous decades. Gertrude Ederly became the first woman to swim the English Channel, and in fact, she beat the men's time by two hours. Margaret Gorman dressed in an American flag cape and a Statue of Liberty crown and became the first Miss America in 1921 um, at the beauty pageant held in Atlantic City with the original hopes of keeping tourists around a little bit longer. Now, Florence enjoyed many of these trends of the era and was the first first lady to entertain guests with feature films after state dinners, which included her showing of The Red Wagon, a silent film that then she had accompanied by a live orchestra. She also, for the first time, invited Hollywood stars to the White House, including Al Jolson, who was the inventor of the talkies, and the Gish sisters, two of the major act actresses of the silent era. Now, Florence had uh, the Navy band play jazz music, and she participated in the new dance trends, including the well-known Charleston. Uh, Florence actually invited Marie Curie to illustrate her view of professional women as equal to men as she and her husband partnered in their award-winning scientific research, which of course included the discovery of radium. She hoped this would be a good example of how ideal family relationships would work in the future. Now, when the Curies actually visited in 1921, the Hardings presented her with a gram of radium. Uh, also supporting scientific research, the Hardings met Albert Einstein during his American tour in 1921. Uh, now, the 19th Amendment, of course, passed in August 1920, given, giving women the right to vote, and of course, is one of the most important historical events of the century. Now, Harry Byrne, a legislator from Tennessee, tipped the scale in favor of passing the amendment, especially after listening to his mother, who had told him, don't forget to be a good boy and help Mrs. Cat put the rat in ratification, effectively encouraging him to cast that deciding vote. Florence would become the first first lady to vote for her husband to be president of the United States. After the ratification, Warren, Warren Harding said, quote, I rejoice with you. Now the decade also saw tragic events, including 40 tornadoes that killed hundreds from Georgia to Wisconsin on Palm Sunday in 1920. Scandal also rocked the sports world when allegations that the so-called Black Sox rigged the 1919 World Series. Following the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918 and the end of World War I, both of which took the lives of hundreds of thousands of Americans, the economy was less than roaring at the start of the 20s. Um, unemployment was high and stock prices were plummeting. However, either way, the early 20s was a time of innovation and introduced many positive social and cultural trends. Uh, now, Florence Mabel Kling was born on August 15, 1860 in Marion, Ohio to Amos and Louisa Kling. Florence, the oldest of three with younger brothers, Clifford and Vitalis, who they called Tal. Supposedly, her father had hoped his firstborn would be a boy and therefore kind of raised Florence, who they nicknamed Flossie, to be more strong-willed than other girls of her era. She grew up very privileged because her father was one of the richest men in the city due to his successful hardware store leading to other business opportunities. And so she was kind of able to experience a lifestyle of living in a lavish home with piano lessons and equestrian training. However, her father was very oppressive and her mother suffered from depression. So for instance, if the children didn't make curfew, they were actually locked in their room and had to take care of themselves until the next morning. Uh, now, Florence attended the Union School in Marion and studied a variety of languages, including Latin and Greek, astronomy, map making, and focused heavily on classical piano. In addition to her schoolwork, she also worked in her father's hardware store. In 1877, Florence attended the Cincinnati Conservatory of Music with the hopes of eventually becoming a world-famous concert pianist. In 1880, at the age of 19, she eloped with Henry DeWolf, sometimes known as Pete, who was also from Marion. Florence gave birth to their first child, Marshall Eugene, in September of the same year. However, Henry was an alcoholic who was described as an unreliable father and husband, was an extravagant spender and extremely irresponsible with their money, leading to their divorce in 1886, when Florence also took back her last name. 
However, the marriage has only ever been thought to be common law. There's not a lot of paperwork on it. And he eventually left her and their child, even though she is said to be the first first lady to be divorced before marrying a president. After they separated, her parents unofficially adopted and raised Marshall, kind of led to a strained relationship between he and his mother for the rest of their lives. Uh, Florence, not wanting to live at home, became a piano teacher to local children in, in her hometown of Marion, charging 25 cents an hour in order to support herself. Now, sadly, her son used both the Kling and DeWolf last names at different times throughout his life, and he always just had this very strained relationship. Uh, he went on to marry Esther and had two children, George and Jean, before passing away of tuberculosis in Denver in 1915. Um, she met the handsome and dashing Warren Harding, who was the owner of the local newspaper, the Marion Star, in 1889. Florence, defiant and headstrong as always, married him despite her father's disapproval on July 8, 1891, at their new home on Mount Vernon Avenue in Marion. Although the marriage resulted in much womanizing on Warren's part, Florence seemingly overlooked it as it did lead to positive opportunities for herself, which included not only running the newspaper in his absence, but also fixing the business operations as a whole. Now, shortly after they married, Warren had a breakdown and was admitted to Battle Creek Sanitarium. During this time is when Florence basically ran the newspaper, acting as not only business manager, but also making uh, some editorial decisions. Florence did not write or edit stories, but she did kind of make decisions in regards to those things, often telling reporters to cover certain events, providing leads and sources, looking for human interest stories and things of that nature. Now, without effort or resistance, she won the support and respect of the male staff. She worked as a business manager, but did not have a separate salary from her husband. She also hired the first female reporter in the state, Jane Dixon, and realigned the deliveries of the newspaper to homes around the city to make it more efficient and profitable. The newsboys she hired were also given initiatives for good work, including pocket knives um, and whistles, all of which was to make their job a little bit easier. She most importantly brought world news to the area by subscribing to a wire service. Because of her experience in the newspaper business, she was comfortable with reporters and helped create their public image and even reviewed press releases. Uh, these uh, experiences, again, allowed her to be just very comfortable with the press, especially when she entered the public eye, making her basically the first first lady to know how to manipulate the press and develop what would become the photo op. Although she was self-conscious about how she looked in newsreels and photographs, she can be seen in the footage directing the cameraman on how to set up the shot and what she wanted them to focus on because she wanted to show action and motion, not posed pictures. Uh, Florence was also the first first lady to operate a movie camera and appear in her own newsreel shorts. Uh, Florence suffered from chronic kid kidney disease beginning in 1905 and would often be sent to bed for days or even weeks at a time with nephritis that gave her high fevers and severe abdominal pain. But even so, she was very much by Warren's side as much as possible during his campaigns. She had a serious attack in 1913 uh, that did require emergency surgery, but she still encouraged Warren to run for a seat in the Senate, which she also served as campaign advisor. Warren's election to the Senate, paired with their move to D.C., all took a toll on her, and she was treated for depression, but she eventually became friends with socialite and heiress Evelyn Walsh McLean, who owned the Washington Post and also owned the famous and cursed Hope Diamond, and with whom she played bridge and went to movies with. Uh, now, during World War I and during this time, Florence was working alongside other senators' wives to create a Red Cross unit that provided clothing to soldiers, and she passed out coffee and sandwiches to the men departing from Union Station. She also assisted Lou Hoover in creating places for female workers to eat and relax, as well as helped other women from her home state of Ohio find housing. Florence took a very active role in her husband's political campaigns, as well as the Ohio Republican Party. In the 1920 presidential campaign, the Hardings became known for their famous front porch campaign, the last of these types of campaigns, at their home at 380 Mount Vernon Avenue in Marion, where people from all over came to hear his speeches and wait to have their picture taken with the Hardings. His strategy echoed William McKinley, also from Ohio, Canton, actually, who successfully campaigned from his front porch back in 1896. And in fact, the flagpole from the McKinley's home was placed in the Hardings' yard. Now, these gave her the opportunity to be both a modern as well as traditional 
uh, lady in the eyes of the American voters. Now, Florence advocated for his nomination during the Republican convention more so than any other wives. She was also very popular with the press and basically pushed his nomination after the convention was deadlocked. Harding was chosen as the Republican nominee for the 1920 election, but was described as the quote, dark horse candidate. But his campaign manager believed he looked the part. Uh, he promised a return to normalcy after the country had been devastated in the previous years with World War I and the global pandemic, both of which took, again, hundreds of thousands of American lives and completely changed uh, that time period. Uh, this also included race riots, labor strikes, and the rise of the Red Scare after the Russian Revolution. So back to normalcy and America first became Harding's campaign slogan. Interestingly enough, newspaper ar newspapers argued that normalcy wasn't actually a word and changed it to normality, but Harding proved them wrong by showing his word was in the dictionary while theirs was not. Uh, now, Florence became first lady after Warren's landslide victory, the largest margin of success for any presidential candidate until this point in history, on November 2nd, 1920. And it was the first time in history the results of the election were broadcast nationwide on Pittsburgh's KDKA radio. However, many Americans did not own a radio yet, and smaller towns, including Marion, had no way to receive the signal. Now, he's the only president to actually have been elected on his birthday. Um, election night was not a restful one for Florence because the couple supposedly stayed up all night contemplating their upcoming time at the White House, as well as reading telegrams with messages of congratulations. Florence also was supposedly lifted onto a group of supporters' shoulders, stating, quote, I don't feel any too confident, I can tell you. I haven't any doubt about him, but I'm not so sure of myself. Prior to the inauguration, Florence met uh, with outgoing First Lady Edith Wilson for a tour of the White House, accompanied by her friend Evelyn McLean. Florence and Edith uh, actually had one interesting acquaintance in common, astrologer Madame Marcia Champney. Florence had been introduced to her through Evelyn and then whom she continued to use for years to come. Marcia said Florence was, quote, a child of destiny and also correctly predicted Warren would win the presidency but also said that he would die suddenly before the end of his term. In order to keep their meetings out of the press, Florence was nicknamed Jupiter, and Marcia made frequent visits to the White House for tarot readings um, and also used a crystal ball. Overall, Florence eventually was honest with the public about her reliance on astrology, and in 1938, Marcia wrote an overly exaggerated article for Liberty Magazine titled, When an Astrologer Ruled the White House. Uh, Florence was intrigued by the supernatural and the occult. She also believed that the only reliable and true thing in life was the stars and would often be seen by her niece looking up at them and identifying the constellations. Those close to Florence also recall she was extremely superstitious. Uh, now, the inauguration was held on March 4th, 1921, during which she supposedly secretly recited the words of his speech. Florence was the first incoming first lady to ride to the Capitol with her predecessor, and upon their arrival at the White House said, well, Warren Harding, I got you the presidency, now what are you going to do? Uh, Warren was also the first president-elect to ride to the inauguration in an automobile, because up to that point, it was always for strong carriages. The Hardings canceled their inaugural ball for the same reasons the Wilsons had done back in 1913, seeing as needlessly extravagant and a waste of the taxpayers' money. They also didn't accept the $10,000 off offered to decorate their personal living spaces. Now, although the 20s were a time of prosperity, the decade did see a little bit of a recession in 1921, and Florence was very much praised for her budgeting skills. However, she also hosted very lavish parties at the White House that would often have thousands of guests. Uh, the campaign had promised a neighborly administration, and right off the bat, she made the decision to keep the windows and gates open to the White House. In addition, she immediately opened the White House to visitors, often conducting tours herself, claiming it was the people's house, and they should have access to it and the president. In fact, when she greeted the public, she physically touched them, hugged them, sometimes even kissed them on the cheek, which was previously unheard of for a first lady. She was extremely personable and very much enjoyed chatting with everyday Americans. Uh, now, Florence Harding was known as the Duchess, and her husband also referred to her as the boss. These are both pretty appropriate nicknames for a first lady who literally took issues such as women's suffrage and equality into her own hands, which has also led her to being known as the model for the modern first lady. She was one of the earliest first ladies to feel that citizenry were 
kind of her big main goal for her role. And in, in, and she was entailed to more than just being a hostess at the White House. Uh, she said, I feel that there's a great duty and responsibility, which I must live up to. Now, Florence was also the first First Lady to send personal correspondence to the letters she received, uh, which she usually read those after breakfast and was generous in posing for photographs. Uh, she worked publicly with wounded veterans of World War I, but also privately with those she referred to as my boys. Florence would be photographed in order to spark interest on veterans' welfare with the public and also visited them without notice, having dinner and taking notes on their concerns and needs that she might possibly be able to address. She made several visits each week to the Walter Reed's Hospital Red Cross and Convalescent Home to see the men. She began a campaign called the Less We Forget Week to collect donations of items needed in the hospital wards and would eventually uh, visit veterans just across the country whenever they were traveling. She went as far as to have her car stop and pick up veterans to take to their destination if she saw them on crutches. As the first First Lady to be in office after World War I ended, she led a national effort to create the World War I monument at the National Mall. She hosted garden parties for disabled veterans and invited a particularly famous doughboy to perform at the White House before his national tour. On Armistice Day, November 1921, Florence placed a wreath on the tomb of the unknown soldier who was laid to rest in Arlington Cemetery after his death in France during the war. The tradition she began, of course, is now done every Memorial and Veterans Day each year, which also includes the symbolic sale of red poppies. The first Veterans Affair Bureau was created due to Florence's hands-on work and passion for those men who served our country. Unlike any previous can presidential candidate's wife, she publicly stated her personal political opinions, especially her pro-women suffrage views. She not only wanted the voting rights, but also equal rights for women in the workplace and more, using her own experiences working at her father's hardware store as a young girl as examples. She invited not only women's political groups to the White House, but girls graduating from high school and college and women's federal workers. She broke an unwritten social code and invited divorced women to social events at the White House. While she had not publicly addressed the issue of birth control, she refused to condemn the movement uh, when it was pressed by a reporter. Florence was also honorary president of the Girl Scouts during her tenure and used the opportunity to speak to young ladies about the importance of health and exercise. She also wanted women to learn about government so they could better understand the decisions of political leaders by explaining American politics in a way they may learn more in order to have an advantage in voting now that they have the right. She also influenced her husband to appoint women into political positions, which included Ruth Hannah McCormick to the Republican National Committee in 1920. She was also the first First Lady to address Congress. Uh, Florence envisioned a, uh, a, quote, community of women working together under the guidance of other women and realized she could use the White House to recognize accomplished women on a national scale. In fact, she also refused to wear a wet wedding ring because she stated it symbolized bondage. She believed someday that women would actually be the primary income for the household, at least in some capacity, and felt that housewives were more of more importance than they were given because they ultimately decided the budget and maintained it. She also supported a prison reform movement in response to the harsh treatment. Um, she also supported other women's groups, including the American Federation of Teachers and the League of Women's Voters, uh, which all resulted in the building of the first correctional facility just for women. Now, Florence was ahead of her time in regards to supporting African Americans and race equality. She was known for always making it a point to visit the kitchen in order to personally thank the staff and shake their hands. Even though this still followed what was considered protocol at the time, it was an outward and public display of equality hardly seen in any first lady before her. Uh, she was supportive of international causes, including victims of the genocide in Armenia, and uh, included sponsoring a child survivor of that situation. Uh, she also donated to the Chinese Famine Fund. Now, her support did extend to immigrant children, and she generally had a passion for social justice advocacy. Florence was a radical supporter for the humane tr treatment of animals. She supported the National Society for the Humane Regulation of Vivisection and the National League to Conserve Food Animals, as well as the ASPCA and the Animal Rescue League, with focus on their traditional values. And she supported a plan to educate students about humane treatment of animals in public schools. 
when she actually learned that fishermen in San Diego were killing seals solely because they were eating the fish they were trying to catch, she negotiated with the commissioner uh, within the Department of Commerce in order to stop it from happening. She also removed all of the big game heads from the stateroom that had been placed by Theodore Roosevelt and even refused to make appearances at events such as rodeo shows that exploited animals. On many occasions, she would allow their Airedale Terrier, Laddie Boy, to be a guest at animal rights events to raise money and even allowed him to ride in parades. The first, first dog even retrieved golf balls for the president, and they held a birthday party for the first celebrity dog of the White House. Her advocacy is extended into her fashion choices as she refused to wear feathers as part of her wardrobe because they were normally plucked from live birds. Uh, she would also only wear fur as long as the animal had died of natural causes. Uh, she did receive some backlash, however, when she chose to donate money to save an elderly workhorse from slaughter during the 1922 coal miner strikes, which was seen as being inconsiderate to the humans who were suffering. Uh, Florence had always been caring and supportive of horses and concerned with their abuse, uh, all of which was documented in 1916. All of these actions prompted her to be very popular. The song Flow from Ohio was written for her. The silk neck bands she wore were known as Flossy Clings, which played on both her first name, uh, but also her maiden name of Fling, and were considered very fashionable. Her favorite color of violet blue was named Harding Blue, uh, which she thought highlighted her eyes, also became very popular. Uh, she continued to reflect the culture of the era by owning a radio, playing Mahjong, bringing jazz to the White House, and her just fashion choices in general reflected the rage for Egyptian motifs as King Tut's tomb had just been discovered in 1923. Uh, Florence embraced the other fashion trends of her time, but was very conscious of her spending, as always. Uh, she also wore classic aviation gear, goggles, and all, and pants when she had her first experience flying an airplane, becoming the first first lady to fly. However, with all of the positivity and popularity Florence had with the public paired with America roaring out of the previous decade struggles, the Harding administration also unfortunately saw some serious issues such as rising gang violence and organized crime associated with prohibition. Another issue was the Teapot Dome scandal, which involved the Secretary of the Interior, Albert Fall, accepting bribes from oil men for drilling rights on federal land. This widespread corruption within the government would be one of Warren Harding's administration's lasting legacies, uh, paired with his many scandalous affairs. So you can't talk about the Hardings without discussing any allegations against Warren and his cheating habits. Carrie Phillips, who is actually a suspected German spy, attempted to actually thwart the election with allegations of her supposed affair with Warren. Florence used her previous journalistic experience to make sure those allegations against him in regards to the affair, as well as his supposed partial Black ancestry and her first marriage, which made it to seem as if she was a widow, disappear. Uh, the scandalous woman, Carrie Phillips, was ultimately silenced, and they even went as far as to send her on a trip to Asia until the election was over. Another one of her husband's affairs was with his mistress, Nan Britton. Um, this was also during a time when Florence's health was not very well, and she fell very ill with her kidney to the point where she had a near-death experience where she claimed she saw two figures at her bed because she was so septic. Uh, but when she came back from that experience, she said that she had, quote, walked the valley of the shadow of death. Uh, Florence used a secret service, especially to keep up with her husband's whereabouts, as he would often sneak off to her friend Evelyn McLean's mansion, which was known as Friendship, to meet with Nan Britton. Florence was actually the first first lady to be assigned her own agent for protection. His name was Harry uh, Barker, who she became very close with. Now, her illness led to what she described as a blessing because it did bring her and her husband a little closer than ever because he did try to be more present and around her at all times. Uh, this included reading to her in bed about Yellowstone National Park. Also, although favorable with the American public, Florence was less popular than Grace Coolidge, who was wife of the vice president at the time. Florence's popularity did lead her to face becoming more popular than any other first lady at the time since Frances Cleveland due to her appearance in many newsreels, newsreel footage clips, which included her appearing at the Lincoln Memorial dedication. Um, now, the Hardings departed on a cross-country train trip in June of 1923 called the Voyage of Understanding that went north into Canada and finally Alaska, making them the first president and first lady to visit the state. 
Uh, they were then supposed to travel to the Panama Canal in Puerto Rico before returning home to Washington. Now, they were warned against going on the trip due to not only Florence's health issues and Warren's enlarged heart, but she pushed to continue with the plans. Unfortunately, the warnings proved to be true, as well as the prediction of Madame Marcia years earlier all came true when Warren Harding passed away on August 2nd, 1923, at the Palace Hotel in San Francisco. Now, some have attributed his death to bad shellfish that he had eaten uh, because he was complaining of stomach cramps in the weeks before his death, but ultimately it was most likely a heart attack. However, there has always been much speculation around the nature of his death due to Dr. Sawyer, Florence's homeopathic physician who had treated her for years, being seen as incompetent by Dr. Joel Boone, the naval physician that also accompanied the Hardings on the trip. Now, many believe Sawyer gave the president stimulus, stimulants, which is what led to his fatal heart attack. Uh, but we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Now, Florence uh, returned home from California, accompanying her husband's casket back to D.C. And when she arrived, she was accompanied by her good friend, Evelyn, back to the White House. Before the president laid in state at the Capitol, there was a viewing. Um, now, on the first night that his coffin was placed in the East Room of the White House, uh, Florence draped in a black veil, had the flag removed and the coffin open so she could speak with him. Now, finally, Florence once again boarded a train to their hometown in Ohio, where a simple funeral was held and his body was placed in a receiving vault at the Marion Cemetery until final, the final burial location was finished. Now, afterwards, she went to Evan, Evelyn's estate, where they proceeded to go through boxes and boxes of paperwork to determine what to keep and what to destroy, depending on what may tarnish his legacy but she definitely destroyed many of her personal documents as first lady. Following her husband's death, Florence returned once again to DC and moved into the Willard Hotel where she lived for several months. She had hoped to go on a European tour before her kidney disease worsened. She was constantly asked to make appearances and requests for interviews from various magazines and for books, but she declined most of them due to her own declining health and lack of time. Florence had planned several politically motivated trips, including ones to Spain and Europe, as well as potentially run for governor of Ohio. But in early 1924, her health steadily continued to worsen. She returned to Marion, where her personal physician, the good Dr. Ch Charles Sawyer, began overseeing her care at his facility, the Sawyer Sanitarium, where after his passing, his son took over her care for him, uh, which some have seen as this entire move back to Marion was completely influenced by Sawyer himself. Uh, her last public appearance was at a Remembrance Day parade where she was seen standing to salute those who had served our country and those soldiers who she had always been passionate about. Florence passed away on November 21st, 1924 of renal failure and was placed next to her husband in the receiving vault. Their permanent tomb made of white marble was the last of this type of intricate presidential monuments. And it was completed in 1927 at the Harding Memorial in Marion, Ohio, and was officially dedicated by President Hoover in 1931. Uh, now, popular foods of the early 1920s uh, included pimento stuffed celery uh, and tea sandwiches. The cheeseburger was also invented uh, by Lionel Sternberger, a 16-year-old working in their family sandwich shop, who simply put a slice of American cheese on a hamburger one day and called it a cheese hamburger. Uh, now, some of the other foods considered to be the bee's knees back in the 20s were flapjacks, codfish cakes, and mushroom toast. Uh, there was also Hoover stew, which was named after President Hoover. Uh, it's basically just mac and cheese with sliced hot dogs. Foods, especially Chinese, as well as Italian, that were kind of seen as exotic between the 20s became popular as well. Prohibition also affected food trends during this time because many recipes started to leave out liquor uh, from the recipes and replace it with alternatives such as vanilla extract. And although at a dinner party during this time you might not be served alcohol, doctors could actually prescribe medicinal whiskey. Uh, the 1920s saw a spike in the sweet tooth, which translated to fruit cocktails, pineapple upside down cake, and jello molds. Um, the 20s also started modern veg vegetarianism, and peanuts were promoted as healthy alternatives to animal meat. Culinary experimentation with pickles, olives, and relishes boomed. All right, so let's get cooking.
Okay, so just let me get this out of the way. Um, so uh, this evening we are going to start off by making Florence Harding's famous waffles. Um, now her waffle recipe includes sugar, which interestingly enough, she led a national boycott against uh, the product when it became too expensive for regular households to afford. Uh, the waffles though, were known for not being not too sweet and also very fluffy. Okay, so um, I've already separated our eggs. So you'll want two eggs, um, your egg whites and uh, your yolks. So what we're gonna do first is we're gonna take our yolks. and our two tablespoons of sugar, as well as um, our, let's see, our salt and um, our baking soda, baking powder, excuse me. And we're gonna mix that in and that's also going to go in with our milk and our melted butter. And we're just gonna mix that up. And then we're going to slowly add in the flour. Um, now, Florence was actually honorary president of the Girl Scouts um, during her time in office. And before Girl Scouts raised money with cookies, they actually sold waffles. Um, the Washington, D.C. Scouts. Um, also operated a tea room, which was a popular fad in the 1920s. Um, and the tea room there with the Girl Scouts was frequented not only by Florence Harding, but also Grace Coolidge. Um, now, the toppings that they served were very traditional, but we are going to have a very interesting topic when we finish our waffles. So while we're mixing that up, our next step is, and one of her kind of little different things is we're going to um, take our egg whites and we're gonna beat them until uh, they get a little fluffy and form the little white peaks. And we're good. Cool. Um, and then what we're gonna do is we're just going to take just a little bit of the egg white mixture here and stir it in just a little bit. And then we're going to fold in the rest of the egg whites. And then we will bake it on our little mini waffle maker. Um, now, Florence's waffle recipe was widely published um, in the 1920s, um, which she shared that recipe, um, even though she really didn't like to cook, she'd rather work, is what she would say. Um, and it featured a lot of the ingredients that had been rationed during the war. So um, it was uh, also used as kind of a symbol of the return to normalcy and that whole back to normalcy campaign. All right, so we've got our batter. And we'll cook up our waffle. 
And what you'll get is a lovely plate full of Florence Harding's famous 1920s waffle recipes. Um, but Warren Harding actually um, had a little interesting uh, topping for his waffles. He liked to top it with um, chip beef gravy. So um, I actually have not tried it, but that's what we're going to top ours with um, today. Um, now, there actually still is a waffle maker at the Harding home in uh, Marion, Ohio, that is on display. So we'll just give that another minute or two. So we'll we'll just give that just a minute. And um, what we're gonna make next is our almond cookies. Um, now the almond uh, is kind of an interesting uh, story in itself. Um, almonds actually, uh, almond extract, um, but bitter almonds specifically uh, can actually mask the taste and smell of cyanide. Um, in fact, bitter raw almonds, which are very different than the, the ones that you get at the grocery store, can also be potentially poisonous because they actually break down and then release cyanide. But you would literally have to eat a literal ton of these almonds to actually have them be harmful. Um, but it's interesting, um, when I cooked my way through all the First Ladies originally and I used the First Ladies cookbook, um, this is one of the recipes that they featured in that book. And they really gave no explanation as to why almond cookies were attributed to Florence Harding. So I think it's interesting that they chose almond cookies as one of the recipes for Florence, um, especially um, because of all of the poisoning rumors. Um, so of course her husband's death has always been seen as kind of strange and some of, you know, claim that she poisoned him. But contrary to the rumors, Florence uh, obviously did not kill her husband. Um, and most of that all uh, stemmed from a book published in the 1930s by one of their staff members of the Harding administration. It was called The Strange Death of President Harding. And all of that, of course, was ultimately debunked. So we'll put this with our chipped beef gravy on top. Oops. And there you have it, a very presidential waffle. Um, so anyway, with the almond cookies, I just think it's really interesting that they decided to include that as um, part of her recipes. Um, so, but supposedly President Harding was being treated, of course, by Dr. Sawyer and was believed to have been completely misdiagnosed. Um, so what we're gonna do is, um, so, First off, it calls for blanched almonds, um, but if you don't wanna blanch your own almonds, um, at which I did not do this time, you just boil them and then the skin peels off. But you can also just, of course, buy them at the store like that, which is way easier. Um, and so we're gonna take sugar, our grated almonds, butter, lemon rind, and a whole egg um, and mix that thoroughly. And the recipe says to do that with a wooden spoon. We're gonna mix that and then we have our whole egg. And as always, we do, uh, I do have our finished product as well as kind of an in-between uh, because you are actually supposed to chill this dough for about an hour before you use it. So we're just gonna slowly put that in. Um, now, Florence, did the speculation of the poisoning rumors, um, which honestly, with his behavior, um, I don't know that anybody could really blame her, uh, but uh, of course, we're completely untrue, but it didn't help matters that she uh, destroyed all those documents very quickly, um, as well as refused uh, to do an autopsy, um, and um, supposedly, she was threatening to sue the Palace Hotel in San Francisco, um, or was threatening them with a lawsuit. And it was dropped because uh, one of the owners or one of the staff um, actually uh, 
came across a glass that had been sitting next to the president's bed and they claimed that it had a funny odd smell to it and supposedly when they brought that up to her then she dropped the lawsuit okay so we're just going to mix this up real good And it's definitely easier with uh, a mixer, but I wanted to be very true to the uh, recipe itself. And then what, what, what you'll do is you will wrap the dough ball um, in wax paper, and then you will refrigerate it for about an hour, and then you will uh, bake it on 350 until they're a little bit browned. And so we are going to make our dough, but you'll get these lovely cookies that also um, should have three um, of the sliced almonds um, on there. So here's this is the dough that I made already pre-made. So we are going to roll it out. We'll get really good. And you can use any cookie cutters that you want to use for this. Um, and just because of our time, we won't make a whole batch, but we'll make a couple. So we're just going to roll that out a little bit. And then we'll use our cookie cutters. I use two different shapes when I made these originally, and then you're gonna put them on your pre-greased baking pan. And these are pretty good cookies. Um, my husband likes them because they are not very sweet. Um, so they're a pretty good little cookie. So that we're just gonna put our cookies on here and finish with the rest of the dough later okay and then what you'll do is you'll brush the top with your uh beaten egg just to you know make sure it gets brown and then you'll put a couple of almonds just on top and you can put more than three but for whatever reason that's what the recipe calls for is three all right so that's what you'll do to make your almond cookies All right, and our last recipe, which is the most easiest of these uh, particular recipes, um, is the eggplant salad West Coast style. Um, so this is very also very simple. What you're going to do is you're going to take your eggplant, you're going to peel it, and then you're going to bake it um, for about 12 to 14 minutes. It just really until they get kind of browned and soft. Um, and then you're going to create your marinade, which is mayonnaise and vinegar based. And then you're going to put your eggplant in there. And the eggplant itself, when it is baked, is seasoned um, with salt and paprika. Um, now, one other interesting story, um, just because. Um, Florence was such an animal lover and activist, and her dog, uh, Laddie Boy, uh, which of course was known as the first dog, was regularly the subject of newspaper articles, um, and that included interviews with the dog. Um, and Warren Harding would often even write letters in to the newspaper and things pretending to be the dog. Uh, but after Warren's death, um, some newsboys in Massachusetts uh, they decided that they were going to collect pennies from new boy, new, newsboys across the country that were then cast into a statue of the beloved dog. Um, they successfully collected around 19,000 pennies. Um, now, they originally wanted to present the statue to Florence. However, she passed away before its completion. So they presented it to Harry Barker, who was her Secret Service agent and close friend who she had given the dog to. Um, as her health began to decline. Um, so uh, you can also see that statue, I believe it's at the Smithsonian now. So anyway, so what you'll do with your um, 
eggplant West Coast style salad is you will shred up your lettuce a little bit and just put that in there. So this is after you've baked your eggplant and marinated it. So do that. And then you will top it with your eggplant mixture. And it doesn't look very appetizing, but it's actually not terrible if you like eggplant. Do that. Okay, and then your last step is to take some hard boiled egg and you're also gonna top it with that. And that's it. That is an eggplant salad, West Coast style right there. Um, so again, thank you guys so much uh, for joining uh, this evening. And you know, Florence Harding was just one of the most uh, awesome first ladies and so successful. And honestly, you know, just was the bee's knees uh, to use a 1920s term. You know, one of her main topics was always empowering women. Um, especially just in politics, but also just society as a whole. And she really just overcame like kind of all these difficult situations and these allegations against her husband and, um, you know, kind of made strides for women that were completely unprecedented for anyone that had come before her in this particular position. Um, so again, thanks y'all so much. Um, you can follow me for more on Instagram uh, at Cooking with the First Ladies. And of course, uh, as always, follow the National First Ladies Library on all of their socials. And um, I hope we'll see you the next time we do a Cooking with the First Ladies program. Oh, thank you so much, Sarah. I just loved that. Um, Florence Harding is probably one of my very favorite first ladies and you just brought out why <laughs> and she's so underrated that's because of having a husband who kind of like doesn't he like right at the very bottom of the barrel on presidents he it's is. bad because yeah. she was such a fantastic woman herself it's, it's unfair um, because and I'm so glad you you really pointed all that I loved it when you had that girl boss and next to the, the, the newspaper. That was so fun. Well, we have a couple of questions. Um, first of all, um, and uh, I guess did, I'll ask you first, do you, did you read any biographies of, of uh, Mrs. Harding before you did this? Or I know that you do so much with, with the first ladies that I wasn't sure. Do you, have you had a, a book that you would answer or that you would really found it helpful um not okay well not since the, i have not i but i'm gonna say that i know that it would be awesome but carl and he has written a florence harding book and i really really wanted to um but it kind of had a lot going on with her but no no um, no <laughs> you know i i i do i didn't really read a book book about florence harding i mostly read like online biographies with the National First Ladies biographies yes. and the Harding Library. Um, and then I have just several books that, you know, are kind of little snippets of that exactly. first lady. And so that sort of thing. But um, I do know right. he has a Florence Harding book. I would really like to read it at some point, but that would be the one that I know of off the top of my head. Right. Very good. Thank you. That's awesome. I mean, the, the one that I would recommend would be, um, there's an also one by Katie Sibley. Um, and I can't think of the name of it, but she also wrote a book, book on Florence Harding and um, where Carl's book kind of goes into much more about about um, Warren Harding and all of the scandals that went around. Uh, I would say that Kat, uh, Katie Sibley kind of keeps it on um, with on Florence a little bit more. So it depends on what your taste is and what you what you like. If you like a lot of scandal, definitely read Carl's book. <laughs> so, um, and I, I guess that's all we really have in, in the way of questions. Um, oh. Anybody else, uh, uh, anything else you, anyone has to say? Um, I just wanna thank Sarah as always. You're just so fantastic. And I really loved it. Oh, by the way, did, you said you didn't like that um, 
the uh, eggplant salad. Is that just kind of, no, it sounds fascinating. No, I, yeah, I do. The eggplant salad is all right. Um, I don't know that I'm, I don't, cause I have not eaten this yet. I don't know if I'm a fan of chip, chipped gravy on a waffle. Yeah, me either. Um, the waffles are delicious. Her waffle recipe, they are delicious, but I have never tried it his way. So I don't know about that. But yeah, the eggplant salad, if you like eggplant, which I do, it, it is pretty good. It's an interesting little salad. Yeah, I want to try it because I love egg salad. So I'm like, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really tempted to try that one. <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, um, if there's any, no other questions, thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you for joining us, all of you out there. And um, we thank you for your time and uh, stay tuned. What You'll be back in October, right? October uh, for Dolly Madison. Dolly Madison. Oh, that will be fun. So I can't wait. Um, take care, everyone. And, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks. Good night. <laughs>